Hello, this is Nathan Wood, pastor of North Dayton Baptist Church, and welcome to day 254 of the McShane Reading Plan. And we are in 2 Samuel 6, 1 Corinthians 16, Ezekiel 14, and John 15. And today is the 20th anniversary of the destruction of the Twin Towers in New York City on September 11th, 2001. I was a sophomore in high school. I remember the second plane hitting the second tower on live TV. Um, yeah, 20 years. And the cry of today's scripture, John 15, Verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Without me you can do nothing. Every branch that he bear, that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it might bring forth more fruit. I'm not trying to over-spiritualize this, but um, we individually and as a nation are called to abide in the Lord. And sadly, since September 11th, I've seen great revival in individual hearts, and God can bless them. God has blessed his word in the ministry of many individuals, um, um, in their individual homes and lives, and also in their ministries. But consider where we are as a nation after that big wake-up call, big wake-up call. There was a hot second right after that happened where the nation came together. We, uh, people started going to churches. People started looking to the Lord. Um, we started wanting to listen to each other in love. And there, there was a great interest in freedom and what it meant and then everything started getting politicized and oh no how dare you even think about um, considering islam to be the enemy and we went back like sows to our mire and dogs to our vomit um i was saying everybody did but well again i don't want to be political but the fact that 20 years after 9-11 that Afghanistan is the tragedy that it is. Um, I, I don't see how we expect to be victorious in anything that we do as a nation. I don't see, and this continues, I don't understand how we can be consider ourselves, how we can expect to be victorious when we have run from God as well, much as we have. Now, he has been merciful, and I pray his mercy. I do not wish ill upon our nation. I wish God's blessing 100%. But I don't know how we can have the audacity to ask God or expect God to be good to us when we have spat in his face the way that we have. He calls us to abide in him so that we can grow and bloom and we spit in his face. We kill children in the womb. And the State Department of this administration is fighting Texas for trying to protect the unborn. Something is wrong, ladies and gentlemen. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. Bodily autonomy does not give you the right to commit murder. Um, that's just the long and short of it. Now, if you think that I'm just being a man and I'm being bigoted, well, then you're not going to listen to reason anyway. May God have mercy upon you. I'm sorry. You need to, you need to grow a heart and understand that when an infant is killed in the womb, that a human is killed. doesn't matter what you call it. God... I believe takes those children straight to heaven. I really do. Because God is merciful unlike us humans. And unlike the devil. We are self-centered. Far too often. We're called to abide in him. We're called to abide in him. Friends, in, in this 
in this day scripture, we have David bringing the um, Ark of the Covenant into the city of David. And it's important to realize that God holds those he has blessed, Israel, to a higher standard than he does those outside the household of faith. So the Philistines moved the ark on a cart and had two milk cows, and God guided that back to Israel. But as soon as it was back in Israeli hands, somebody messes with it, they're dead. We have a situation where it rocks and somebody tries to steady it, no good deed goes unpunished, shouldn't have been on a cart. Ladies and gentlemen, God has blessed Israel, and so he holds Israel to account. God blessed David, he holds David to account. Doesn't mean that he uh, reneges on his promise, but when he has blessed a nation like the United States, with whom I really don't think that he, uh, we set down a founding documents, and those are wonderful, but he has no such covenant with us. I really don't think. I mean, I mean, he has blessed us, and we need to take our relationship with him seriously. But when we go defiling his holy name and taking him lightly, like a ark rocking on a cart, and it's like, oh, no, well, we can't expect him to do any less for us. Lord, the Lord is deadly in his holiness, ladies and gentlemen. We should not expect his mercy, but he gives it nonetheless. Why? Because we deserve it? No. But because he is loving and merciful. And as Peter says, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Praise the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, as David comes into the city of David in Jerusalem, bringing the ark, dancing and praising the Lord, Michael, Michal, his wife, the son, of, the daughter of Saul, sees him and despises him. And she is made childless. She could have blessed her father's household with the heir. But it wasn't, wasn't to be. God was going to choose to use the heir of adultery and murder to prove his mercy rather than Prove his mercy through the disdainful womb of Michal, who hated her husband. Who hated her husband. Shamefully. Shamefully. Her husband was the king of Israel, and she spurns him. I, um, and dishonors him. And acts ashamed of him and disdainful. And it, that's how we tend to, that's how we're treating God. That's how we're treating Christ. We are looking at him distastefully. We don't like what's in his word. It's not good enough for us. We have a better idea of what goodness is. You know, we, we, we don't like this nation that he's given us. We don't like the word of God that he's given us. We don't like salvation that he's given us. We've got, we've got a much more highfalutin idea of that. You know, we, uh, we just want to turn everything inside out and upside down and top, bottom, bottom, top and call good evil and evil good. We've, we're much more sophisticated than that. We, we have disdain for the son of David. God's going to make us not fruitful. Shame on us. Friends, I don't care if you think that you've done nothing wrong. We need to be like Daniel and the prophets of old on our knees, begging for, for, for God's forgiveness for our nation and for ourselves. Not, oh, Lord, thank you, I'm not as this man, but Lord, forgive us. Forgive me, Lord, for not doing a better job of presenting your gospel in an accurate way. And for those of us who are turning away from you and turning to other gods, the, the gods of uh, idealism, the gods of politicism, the gods of, uh, of whatever ism there is, Lord, 
false religions, false ideologies, uh, false economic systems, or what have you, false sexuality, murder, strife, self-centeredness. Lord, forgive us for, for turning that way and not turning to the Son of Jesus, the Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Christ's name I pray, amen. We need to be praying like that extensively. Ezekiel 14 brings a reminder to Israel in verse 21. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four sword judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword and the famine and the noisome beast, the pestilence to cut them off, to cut off from it man and beast. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know. This just stuck out at me as seeming very much like the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which is in the beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble. But it look, there shall be a remnant that shall be brought forth, both the sons of daughters, they shall come forth to you, etc. There's a remnant of Israel that is always believed. Sometimes the remnant is big, sometimes the remnant is small. Um... It was 7,000 in the time of Elijah. The remnant would have been those who were trusting in the house of David rather than uh, following uh, the rebellion of the house of Saul. And David was going to bless the house of Saul, even though his wife wanted no part of that blessing. Um, he, wants, he wants to bless somebody, and we're going to find that he wants to bless Mephibosheth. But anyway, um, but what happens? Um, the four horsemen representing, I believe, the final judgment go upon Israel. And the judgment happens not to bring final instance, uh, or ex excuse me, not, to, not that God wants them to go to death or destruction, but he wants to drive them to salvation. And also, uh, they're... Um, Look in verse 20, though Noah, and this is repeated a couple times, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I left, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Um, and verse 22 on the other side of it says, Ye behold, yeah, behold, therein shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth, and both sons and daughters, behold, they shall come forth unto you, and they shall see their way and their doings, and ye shall be comforted concerning all evil that have been brought upon Jerusalem, and concerning all that have been brought that I have brought upon it, and they shall comfort you when ye see their ways and their doings, and ye shall know that I have not done without cause, and that I have done it done in it, saith the Lord. There's going to be witnesses to the goodness of God, witnesses or remnant that believe. I believe this is talking about the hundred forty four thousand witnesses in the household of Israel in the time of the tribulation, the seven years, the 70th week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble, the great and terrible day of the Lord, call it what you will. And I don't believe that it's going to be limited to 144,000, but there's going to be specifically 12,000 of each tribe that have a specific calling for them to witness to Israel and the world of the goodness of God. Now, that's a mighty band of witnesses, folks. We've been praying for revival. That's going to be a revival. Lord, send out workers into your harvest. And there it's going to be. And they're going to be Jewish. Because the blindness is going to be lifted from their eyes. They're going to be the representative and the driving force of the remnant. And there's also going to be the two witnesses, but we won't get into that. The point is, folks, is that the concept of a remnant is thematic in Scripture. And undoubtedly, there is a remnant in this nation who truly believes that God has blessed us with a nation under God. But ladies and gentlemen, if we don't hold on fast to him, that indivisible is just a dream and a wish. Again, it's not about provoking towards division, but folks, if we are not united under the sovereignty of God in each one of our homes and each one of our hearts, 
We have no foundation as a nation. If we don't pro proclaim liberty throughout the land, not arbitrarily or selfishly, or you ain't going to do that to me, or, or, you know, being rebellious for arbitrary reasons. If we're not kneel, bowing the knee to our God as a church and as a people, and we're turning to the gods of lust and false gods of false religions and moral and cultural relativism and secularism and scientism, if we're turning our backs and breaking our oaths and, and uh, seeking to worship money and and seeking to steal money from one and give it to another and, and worship people in power and worship our own selves. If we're going to turn to all of this and sow strife rather than peace and, and preaching the gospel of peace, and let's face it, folks, the gospel is not a social justice message. The gospel is a personal salvation message where God wants to meet each individual and transform us from the inside out. And that's where a good society comes from in this world. But he's going to come, ladies and gentlemen, and he's going to make things right. In the meantime, we must, this September 11th, remember why God has allowed our country to be reminded upon occasion. Not that he wants to inflict death and destruction upon us, no. But sometimes he withholds his hand of protection and reminds us how much we're blessed by him. Sometimes he wants us to realize, hey, listen, we need to come back. We need to come back willingly, because if we don't come back willingly, if we don't ask forgiveness willingly, well then, time's curtain may be falling. And the Lord may see fit to take matters into his own hands. Whichever, if the Lord tarries or the Lord's coming tomorrow, maybe today, be sure that when Christ says, as Moses said, who is on the Lord's side, let him come to me that you are on the Lord's side. Not sitting here saying, well, Lord, you better get on my side. No. You get on the Lord's side. You trust in Jesus Christ. You trust that he loved you enough to shed his blood and die for you and rise again so you could rise again forever and live with him. Simple as that. And let that transform you from the inside out. Put aside this pettiness. Put aside this debauchery. Put aside this moral and cultural relativism and selfishness and worship the God of David, the son of David. Stop despising him. Start loving him and following him. Be a part of the remnant. Be a part of the church. And be a, for you, if you're a Jew listening to this, be a part of the remnant of Israel. The time is short. We love you. Have a good day.